Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that we have to gather together on this channel and feast upon your word. Teach us, O oh Lord, the importance of sound biblical doctrine and protect us, dear Lord, from any, any shape, any form of false teaching or worship. I ask this in your precious name. Seal to our hearts that which is truth that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in the book of Revelation, verse by verse. And we've found ourselves in chapter 2 in the, the letters to the seven churches. And we're at the church of Thyatira. Before we visit this church, I just want to point out a few things somewhat uh, in review. These are written to the angels of the seven churches. And my question to you would be, why did our Lord not just simply write to the churches? Why does each letter begin with to the angel of the church at wherever write? Why didn't he do that? And as we go through these letters and we look at all of their many parts, I think that it's not hard to answer that question. Right away from the outset, we see that the Lord's concern is for the message of that church. And so it shouldn't be surprising that we, we read in these letters the things that we do, the criticisms that we read that the Lord had against these messengers of these churches. Now, if you follow this channel, you know where this ministry stands on the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the message that is given us, that's outlined for us, and in, in, primarily in Pauline's epistles, 13 epistles written to the New Testament church, the what I believe is the very lifeblood of the church today. Many Christians spend a lot of time in the Gospels, and there's nothing wrong with that. They're especially attracted by the red letter words of our Lord. But unless we rightly divide the Word of God and make a, the all-important distinction between And without, you know, I try real hard not to use theological terms. Dispensations. Those periods of, in, of time, sections of history uh, in which God is dealing with His people and He's doing so in different ways. It may sh come as a shock to many of you to understand that before Pentecost, and this includes the time in which Jesus, His ministry, His life, earthly, physical life, His ministry, His, me his message to all of Judea, the, the relationship that He had with His disciples, and, and so on and so forth, there was not a single Christian alive. Anybody who has seriously studied Scripture, and most serious, just most serious students of, of of the Bible, they they perfectly know, and they they know they very well understand the fact, the all important fact that. The Word of God is very precise. And it was written, much of it was written to various audiences. 
And it's important to take note of who the Lord is speaking to. We know from much of the Gospels that Jesus came offering Himself as King, offering the kingdom. The message was to Israel if they had accepted Him as their Messiah. He would have ushered in the kingdom. Of course, we know that in the predetermined will and, and foreordained counsel of God, that was not going to happen. That there was a, a much grander purpose in God's plan of redemption to, to bring in the Gentiles. That's us. So that salvation could come to the Gentiles. Israel was set aside in unbelief. And the, but the point I want to, to make here is, is that it was the gospel of the kingdom that was being preached. That's not the gospel that we preach. It will be the gospel that is preached once again that's picked up by the two witnesses during the tribulation period that's continued on after we're gone. You might look at it as, as somewhat of a, a repeat of John the Baptist. But at the present time, our message is the gospel that was given to us by God through Paul. And that is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and raised on the third day, all according to the Scriptures. The, the point that I want to make here, and which I believe is an important one, is as we go through these seven letters, it's interesting to take note of, of just what all seven have in common. There is a common denominator. And that is, we see even in the very first verse of to every letter, it's to the angel, the messenger, of the church right not the church therefore I think it's fair to take note of the fact that the Lord's concern has to do with the message that's being taught I was told a long time ago by someone very insightful as, as it regarded the New Testament and our walk in life and relationship with Christ, that theological error precedes moral error. You can't go through, you can't go through these seven letters without seeing both. You see the theological error, you see the warning, the Lord's concern as it regards false prophets, false apostles, false teaching false worship. Yet at the same time, we see the Lord's commendation to these churches, to those that are within the church that who truly belong to Him, and He commends them for their faith, for their hope, for their love, for their patience, for their perseverance, which I would much rather refer to as preservation. It's not as much that we persevere as it is that, that God preserves us. And God knows those who are His. And we know that in every single church, every, ever since the beginning of the church, there has always been wheat and tear. There's always been sheep and goats. Okay? That's, it's just as common today as it was back then. God knows those who are His. And, and we clearly see that as, as we take and gaze into these seven letters to the churches. That He walks in our midst. That He's the all-knowing God. And so, I just wanted to to, to preface this video with that as we begin our look at the message to the church in Thyatira. Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. 
Now you may be disappointed, I am, to hear me say that I don't understand why that that is the only reference in all of the book of Revelation to the Son of God, uh, that phrase, Son of God. But it is. And I wish I had an answer for you folks. I wish I could tell you why that is. Except that I believe that a lot could be said about the, the, the name Son of God. But I just find it interesting that though the Lord is referred to in so many ways throughout the entire Word of God, it is the only mention of Son of God in the entire book. These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I'm reading from the King James Version. I'll just tell you what I believe this is inferring. And that is, when, when we read eyes like a flame of fire, note it doesn't say eyes like a... Uh, a beautiful uh, blue sky. And his feet are like fine brass. Well, it doesn't say his feet are like soft pillows. Right away, in that phrase, we are looking at the indication of a God who is not only a, a God of love and mercy and grace, but also one of judgment. He will judge His enemies. I know thy works. Well, of course He does. He knows what we think. He knows how we feel. He knows our heart. He knows our motives. <coughs> Excuse me. He knows our love. He knows our service. He knows our faith. He knows our patience and our works. And He takes note of our lives right down to the finest, minute detail. He knows those who are His. He knew those who were His at the church at Thyatira. He knew quite well who, whom He had chosen in, in Christ before the foundation of the world. He had set them apart for service, for life, for relationship, for growth. But there were those at Thyatira that were not His. And that shouldn't surprise any of us. That shouldn't, we shouldn't look at that as anything out of the ordinary, but practically normal, no matter what generation that we live in which we live. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. That's a singular. He's got a few things against the messenger. And I've pointed out through all of these letters how I believe that the messenger is a human messenger. Whether it's the pastor, elder, you name it, it's a human messenger. It's, or it could be both that and the message itself, the message of the church, which is of primary importance to these churches. I want you to take note of the fact that as you go through and you look, take a serious look at all seven letters, you don't see the Lord trying to, 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 to launching into seven sermons on how the, these believers in these churches need to clean up the flesh. They need to clean up the old man. I'll say it again. One of the things that, that you ought to write down and po paste to your refrigerator is the fact that theological error precedes moral error. There's another true saying, and that is we cannot legislate morality. You can't pass laws to make people righteous. That's not true in either the real world if you know, I put that word real in quotes, or in Christianity. We are not under law, but we're under grace. Law is not going to save you. 
It's not going to redeem you. It's not going to save you. It's not going to make you any more righteous than what you already are in Christ. And He knows our works. There at the church at Thyatira, verse 20 makes it absolutely clear that He has something against the messenger. And that is that He was suffer he suffereth that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants. And we'll stop right there for a moment. He suffered. He tolerated it. He knew that this was taking place, and yet he turned a blind eye to it. Now, why that is, I guess we could speculate on that all day long, but the fact of the matter is, is that this is what it was the criticism that our Lord gave to the messenger at the church at Thyatira. There were there was a false prophetess. Now he the Lord inter, interestingly, the Lord refers to this woman as Jezebel, and yet Jezebel we know lived in, in the eight hundreds BC. And yet he says, You tolerate Jezebel. Well, so it I don't think I'm going out on a limb, too far out on a limb here to suggest that there were, Jezebel was not there at that church. He's using the phrase to describe something that related to what they would have understood about Jezebel. Now, if I was to spend time talking about just how deep deep into outer space theologically this woman Jezebel was. Well, I could do that. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to take the time to go through all of the idol worship, the false uh, teaching, the, the Baal worship, the, uh, the temples that... Uh, that her wicked king husband Ahab, you know, allowed her to actually built for her to to actually perform these rituals and these, these acts of false worship. I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of historical detail. I don't think that that's that, that might be good reading, but I think what we need to understand is 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 the fact that. Jezebel, simply, if you, if you really just wanted to look at it simply, Jezebel represents false teaching, false doctrine, false worship. I mean, the, the, the ways, the means, the manner in, in which she, she was involved in that, to me, are, are, are interesting. And, and, and they, they're, I'm not gonna, by, I don't by any means suggest that it's not worthwhile to look into all that. What I'm saying is, is, is that the messenger at the church at Thyatira was tolerating such false teaching. Now, why does he say Jezebel? It's uh, a friend of mine suggested that, uh, that I know personally, suggested that, well, Jezebel is mentioned because false teaching is so attractive and so enticing and so seductive. Whereas true biblical sound doctrine, here's a shock for you, for some of you, is not. Well, just, just take a look at, at the difference in views. If, if, or church attendance. If you, if you find a church out there, folks, that's teaching sound biblical doctrine that their focus is on the teaching of the Word of God, not all the, the rest of the stuff. That's their primary uh, interest is, is deep study of the Word of God and their, their emphasis and their focus is on doctrine, the doctrine which leads to godliness. There's not going to be too many cars out in the parking lot. But if you want to avoid all that because you don't want to, you don't want to be controversial, you don't want to be just 
disrupt people's lives. You don't want to cause commotion. You don't want there to be division. You don't want there to be argument. We just got to get together and we just all got to love one another and forget about doctrine. That's, that, that's just divisive. Doctrine is divisive. And it's true that nowadays, today, the, the time in which we're living, doctrine is a bad word. And yet this ministry and this channel is primarily interested in and focused on the doctrine which leads to godliness. Jezebel. It's attractive. It's easier. You don't have to study. It's too hard. You don't have to take all of that, that, that really hardcore Christian stuff so serious. It's just... That's, that's for Bible scholars. That's for pastors and teachers. It's not for the, the common clergy, the, the laity. You know, it's not for the laity. And we don't want to be involved in that. But the Lord gave a stern message of warning to the church at Thyatira. And it's, I think it's worthy to, uh, to, of taking note of just how severe this warning was. Now before I go any further, I want to also remind you of the fact that I have stated through this that my belief that, that is not the preterist view that we're looking at here. It's, it's also not, uh, I don't think it's correct to say that even though I do believe there is a, a, a very primary emphasis a very, uh, as far as our lives are concerned, it is okay to say that I believe that these seven churches describe the condition of the church prior to our Lord's return. But we have to be careful when we say that, because when we say that, what we're basically insinuating is, is that all those who have lived in past generations, for the past nearly 2,000 years, all of those churches, all of those generations, well, I suppose they could have just looked at the seven letters and skipped over that and just said, well, we're, we're not, you know, we're, I don't think that we're living and we're the final generation. I don't believe that we're the generation that's going to see the Lord's return. So it's not describing us, the condition of us prior to the Lord's return. Do you follow what I'm saying? I don't think we're allowed to do that. And, you know, Christians love talking about, you know, the doctrine of eminency. Well, the Lord can come at any time. Well, that's true. That is true. Eminent, I believe, is, is a word that it more describes the fact that we only live 100 plus years, if that, 80 to 100 years, 120 max. That's nothing compared to the expanse of time. And that no matter what generation that we would have lived, the Lord's coming return would have been imminent, especially in the sense that, that the rapture, as far as the body of Christ is concerned, that rapture of the saints is an event that takes place in the lives of those both dead and living. Both dead and living. You know, uh, I actually know Christians who 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 well understand the fact that that it's not of course it would be wonderful to be alive when the lord returns we don't have to undergo uh, the process of physical death and that there may be some truth to that but you've also if you follow this channel you understand that that i have a little issue with the, with mixing time and eternity that there is no time in eternity and, and that eternity is not an extension of time. It's a whole entirely different dimension. And how I believe that our death, our physical death, because, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, our death equals, if we were to die physically, death equals the rapture. Because the next thing in our experience, one microsecond after death passes upon us is that we are thrust forward to, if you want to talk about time, this from the perspective of time, we're thrust forward 
into the future to the point and time of the rapture. Our death equals the rapture. I do, honestly, people, I believe that if I was to fall over dead with a heart attack today, that in my experience, the very next thing I would experience would be the rapture, even though you were still in time waiting for it to occur. Okay? Now, that, that is, I've done several videos on that, and it's not my intention to get sidetracked off onto that issue here. All I'm simply saying is, is that these churches, there was an application to them in the past just as well as there is to us. I'm sure it does describe the condition of the church prior to our Lord's return, but I'm also equally convinced that these seven letters describe the condition of the church at any time in church history, and there are those who want to go past you know, the rapture, beyond the rapture, into the day of the Lord, and say that this also describes the church, the organized church, not the organism, the body of Christ, but the, but the organization of church. The word church just doesn't mean, it doesn't mean body of Christ. The word church means any gathering, any congregation at any time. Uh, I pointed out the fact that Moses was referred to in connection to the church in the Old Testament. And so some suggest that this carries over past the rapture into the day of the Lord. That phrase that we know is the day of the Lord that refers to the tribulation period as well as the kingdom, the entire length of the 1,000 years. That's the day of the Lord. I'm not willing to go that far, but I, but I, but I do suggest that you entertain seriously the idea that these seven letters were not just written to whatever generation just happens to be at the door of His coming for His church. He says that He gave her space to repent of her fornication. And of course, you know, we can talk a lot about fornication. We know that there's the physical fornication, but there's also spiritual fornication, and that is having an affair with some other God. Okay? You are, you are, you belonged to to the God that created the heavens and the earth, but you have, you you're involved in worship and the worship of strange gods. That is fornication, spiritual fornication, and I believe that the Holy Spirit's primary thought here is toward that. Not, I'm not suggesting there wasn't actual fornication taking place. And he gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Now, it sounds as if, from the text, just a casual reading, that she had the ability to repent. And, of course, that is absolutely not my position. And the reason it's not my position, the reason I believe that the text is showing us that she could not have in any way, no way, no how repented, is because of who she was. Of course, the Lord gave her space. But she repented not, absolutely did not, could not repent. The text goes on to say that, Behold, I'll cast her into a bed, and the word bed there is a sick bed, just as the same word as, as our Lord having the one who was sick in bed to pick up his bed and walk after he had healed him. It's a sick bed. A sick bed. A bed of sickness. I will cast her into a bed of sickness, The text says, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to try to clarify something. And I hope and I pray that you people don't misunderstand. Those who follow this channel know that I am absolutely pre trip The church will not step foot one, not one foot inside Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation period. What we know is the tribulation period. But what I want you to consider, folks, is that when the rapture takes place, and I've suggested this before, I do not believe the churches will be boarded up. They will not be empty. There will be people there who were left behind, not 
because they were members of the body of Christ who didn't live a good enough life to merit or, or to earn the rapture, but because they were never members of the body of Christ. And they could populate these churches. They could populate the tribulation period. They could be actively, they could be alive within the tribulation period because they, they weren't, re and I got to be careful here. <laughs> Listen to me, folks. Let me try to put it quite a, just as simply as I possibly know how. Do not think that it would be a mistake for us to think that after the church, the rapture of the church occurs, that there are no elect on earth. God has no elect. I'm talking about those for whom Christ died, those whom He had redeemed through the, the person and the work of Christ, that they had died in His place and they were chosen, okay, before the foundation of the world, set apart from their mother's womb. But it was appointed unto them to be redeemed, okay, and because they, they were redeemed and they and to be saved inside the tribulation period. They're not members of the body of Christ, but they become tribulation saints. Okay? Why? Because they were suddenly redeemed within the tribulation period? No. They were redeemed when Jesus Christ died in their place. Okay? There, there were those there at the church of Thyatira, okay, that the Lord knew because He knew their works, that there were wheat and tare both, and that there would be those who would the, the prophetess Jezebel would seduce and entice to, to get into a sick bed with her in, and that in reference to, their, to false worship, false doctrine, false gods. And there was a danger in that. The danger is not that, that, that you got to understand, folks, listen to me very carefully. We have to be careful when we go through here. These, the Lord clearly states that she seduces my servants. My servants. Okay? I think we're looking at a double sided coin, so to speak, here. She did seduce God's servants, both those who were His, members of the body of Christ, but also those who were not. But God, nevertheless, God's elect, destined, determined to be left behind, to go into the tribulation period where they would be saved or not saved, depending on whether they were elect or non-elect. Did that make sense? I don't, I, I'm not trying to make this more complicated than... than than it already is. But when we look at Scripture, when we take it as a whole, we have to understand that, that when, we're, when we're reading down through these verses, that Scripture, that uh, interprets Scripture. That it, the, there's an importance to look, it's important to look at context. It's important to look at at personal pronouns. Who's he talking to? It's, there's a difference between thou and them. Okay? There's, we need to take note of these things. We need Doctrine is built precept upon precept. We can, we can easily be steered off in the wrong direction, which is actually what we don't want to do here, simply by having a... The, because there is a lack of understanding about biblical doctrine, because we don't know that we're, that we're redeemed by the blood of Christ only, that it's, we're saved by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, not our own faith, and, and so on and so forth. We could go on with that all day. Doctrine, okay? And, we, and so when we come to any, any one particular verse, it's to be interpreted in light of the whole. That's what I'm saying. We don't want to bring our preconceived ideas or false notions uh, falsehoods into a verse to try to understand or interpret the meaning of that verse. That's what I'm saying. I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. And I believe that's the tribulation period. 
except they repent of their deeds. Now, if they belong to Him, they will. If they don't belong to Him, they won't. And I will kill her children with death. That is a future tense. And all the churches, all the churches shall know that I am He which searcheth the reins in the hearts. He knows those who are His, folks. And you know who you are. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. I believe that's you can, you can take that to mean that He'll reward them according to their works. He'll reward those that belong to Him, us believers, according to their works, both. I think it's primarily speaking of Bema. Bema. We're looking at them being cast into great tribulation and us being judged for our works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, unto you, the messenger, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. Folks, did you know that the Lord Himself has not put any other burden upon you except to stand fast, to hold fast that which you have already received until He come? And what is that? that you're not saved by your own goodness, that you're not saved by your own faith, that you're not saved by your own endurance, your own perseverance, that you're not saved by anything. You weren't redeemed because of anything you did. You're not saved because of anything that you did. You are saved because and redeemed and saved because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ who died in your place. The Gospel that... that The perfect, finished work of Jesus Christ in our lives is the only burden we bear. And believe me, folks, what a burden that is. It's bittersweet. It's a burden, but it's a, it's a lovely burden. But it, it is a burden that only those who have come to understand what Christ has done on behalf of His people bear that they only they know that. And that is all the Lord expects us to bear. I believe that to be what the text is saying. But that which you have already hold, that you have already, what have you been given? We've talked a lot in the 500 videos about all the blessings that we've received in Christ. We're to hold that fast until He comes. And he that overcometh, that's His people, and keepeth, guardeth my works unto the end. Folks, notice it doesn't say your works. It says my works. Th these are words out of our Lord's own mouth to the messenger at Thyatira. My works, saith the Lord. Not your works. My works. If you guard those works unto the end, to Him will I give power over the nations. And He shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my Father. No wonder it says, Eyes like unto a flame of fire and His feet are like fine brass. We're looking at co-reigning, ruling with Christ as promised. And I will give unto Him the morning star. And I understand that Lucifer as well as, or Satan as well as Jesus is both referred to as the morning star. But Jesus being the bright and morning star. I believe what the text is saying, what the Lord is saying is I will, and many commentators will disagree with me on, or not many, but some will disagree with me on this. Well, the Lord can't possibly say that He will give us Himself. 
And, you know, I, I spent some time thinking about that. Well, how could he be saying that he, he will give uh, us himself, the morning star? I'm going to give you myself. Well, hasn't he already done that? And that's where we're going to pick up next time. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I want to thank you all for all your prayers concerning my recent injury with my neck, shoulder, and elbow when I had that run in with uh, some, an object a little bigger than me. The ibuprofen and the uh, Advil has, has helped a lot. Uh, I've never been one to, to take painkillers of any type. I, I, I have this, I, I've always had the idea that, it, that after a while, if you, if you get to using these, these painkillers, then after a while they're not as effective. So I've spent most of my life avoiding all that, but I've entered into a new phase or that I'm having to do that a lot now. It hurts. You don't run into an 800-pound 800, 800 steer without... I'll, I'll very quickly tell you that in 2012, I had a 1,200-pound a horse rear up and his sleep, feet, back feet slipped on gravel. He fell back on top of me. He shattered four bones in my wrist to dust. Uh, cracked a few ribs, uh, got a slight concussion. Uh, 1,200 pounds of horse flesh came back down on top of me and put me in the hospital. Uh, that was the, the right side of, of my body. Uh, the broken wrist, which they had to put pins in, drill screws into the, the arm bone, put an external fixator on, and it, it left me with nerve damage on the right side, on the left side of my body. This recent in, in injury has left me with some nerve damage on the right side of my body. But I'm doing okay, and I want to just say I appreciate all of your prayers, all of your love, your support. I thank you so much. Be safe out there, and until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.